Welcome to episode 20 of the Kevin Rook Show. Today's conversation is with Jesse Schrader, the co-founder of Amboss. Now, for those who don't know, Amboss is a lightning explorer, basically a tool that allows you to check out nodes, channels, capacity, fee rates across the network, and gives you data as a node operator to make better decisions about where to allocate capital. And in our conversation, we talked about exactly how node operators are thinking about capital allocation today, how Amboss can help them. And we also discussed some of Amboss's business model, interesting new Lightning applications, and some of the ways that Lightning is going beyond payments and acting as a messaging protocol as well. Just a quick shout out before we get into the episode, today's show is sponsored by Voltage. Voltage is the premier provider of Bitcoin and Lightning node infrastructure. You can check them out at voltage.cloud and I'll have more on Voltage later in the show in the lightning round. Jesse, thanks for coming on the show today. I'm really excited about this conversation. And maybe a good starting point here is to tell me about the first moment that you got excited about lightning and building on lightning. Ah, uh, okay. Um, I think the my journey for lightning started with Poyo Feed. Um, and I had downloaded the Eclair mobile wallet. Um, and I opened my first channel to, uh, what I found out was the, the Poyo feed node. And I had to, I had to look it up and I found out, um, in the payment destination, which node I was paying to. Um, cause I, I got to watch that, the, the food dispense and watch the chickens all run over. Um, and I discovered, I looked it up on, uh, on one ML and I saw the, it was the Chicopee node. And so I opened up a, a channel using Eclair, the mobile wallet, and opened my first channel. Um, that was in late 2018. I think it was like around Christmas time. Um, and I think that's where it, it started to become really cool because I'm sending a, a Bitcoin payment um, to who knows where. Um, and it's like, you know, coming into the satellite feed video and, uh, yeah, it, it just, it was an instant interaction with another part of the world, um, by sending, by sending money, um, instantly and for practically no fee. Um, it was, uh, it was really eye opening. I ended up sharing uh, Poyo feed to a whole bunch of my coworkers at the time, um, and got pretty excited about it. Um, after that, it was, uh, it was finding the, the communities on, on telegram because I found out there's, there's other node, uh, nerds that are and nodes like me that, uh, that think this technology is, is really cool. Yeah. And so talk to me about then the transition from first discovering lightning and using it to then deciding, you know what, I'm going to help build this lightning explorer. And, and build out Amboss. What was that process like? Sure. Um, let's see. So I was uh, operating in this in this Telegram community, uh, Lightning Liquidity and Pool, and uh, we. I think I, I found out about Thunderhub, and it was a really cool interface to to actually manage your node. Um, so I started working with uh, with with Anthony um, AP uh, on. And just providing some feedback um, as a as a user and at a, a pretty dedicated user of of Thunderhub, um, I sent him a couple of ideas and he saw me helping out others in the chat um, and eventually reached out to me saying, "Hey, uh, do you want to team up?" Um, and uh, I mean, I was I was honored uh, because here's a really talented. Uh, both front end and back end uh, developer, um, and like he he saw that I was uh, a little bit more on the on the social side and happy to happy to chat with people. Um, so the the two of us um, tend to work really well together, um, and we were able to uh, kind of brainstorm all sorts of ideas about uh, how to how to build out this this lightning network. Um, so. You know, where could we take this? Uh, what do we want to build? And uh, the, the first thing we ended up building was sort of like a power node manager where you could add multiple nodes 
into um, like a single manager because we recognize that like as the Lightning Network grows, like uh, you might you might manage someone else's node uh, for them, uh, and there might be macaroons so that you could you could actually um, you could help someone else out because as really early adopters of Lightning, like we're we're going to be leaders in this space. Uh, we'll be comfortable dealing with channels and fee rates and uh, all of the, the technicalities. So uh, we could recognize that, that that was an area of, of future growth. Um, but then when we realized uh, when looking for a market, um, most of the, the uh, advanced uh, people doing the Lightning Network, uh, they generally write their own scripts to, to manage multiple nodes. Um, and so having a multiple node manager with a UI and everything, um, it didn't really fit, fit the market. Um, but, but we had, uh, both, um, saw a need for an updated lightning network explorer, um, and then, uh, started yeah. to build ambos.space, which is the, the product that, um, is now, uh, it now has uh, about 17 to 18% of the nodes of the public nodes on the network, um, have, uh, claimed their node on Amboss space. Oh, very cool. So how do you, how do you pitch Amboss when you're explaining the business? Like other than saying it's an explorer, I know you have a bunch of other features. Um, you have communities, you have verified nodes, like what is the kind of Amboss vision? Yeah. Uh, the, the Amboss vision is that. Uh, the Lightning Network is a it's a high performance and sustainable payment network, um, and and what does that mean? Uh, well, like th there are a bunch of nodes and they're they're kind of sole operators. Uh, when the when the Lightning Network was was first starting, um, there's people uh, running nodes and and scripts, and it's not so communicative. But uh, what what we're find what we found out was, um, you actually do need to coordinate with the other people, um, on the network, be able to contact them. If something is going wrong with your node, or if, uh, you want to do some economic coordination, like, uh, ask them to adjust their fees or trust them with, with doing a swap. So I give you lightning and you give me on chain Bitcoin, um, and just organizing that and establishing reputation. Uh, so, so there's, there's a, a need there, but when it comes to Amboss as a business, um, at the end of the day, it will be an, a data analytics business. Um, and so when I'm looking at the, the market size, uh, what, what we did is, uh, is look at industries, um, like large industries in the world and compare the sizes of the data analytics industry relative to, to the industry as a whole. And so we looked at uh, healthcare, uh, automotive industry, and and saw that the data analytics industry is a small fraction of that. Um, and so the when the with the investors or the people that we talk to about Amboss the business, um, we say, hey, look, uh, people are going to need to make uh, tough economic decisions uh, about um, how to allocate their resources. Um, for the Lightning Network, that's we're talking about SATs. Um, how are you going to allocate your SATs? Who are you going to connect to? Um, and as the as the mempool increases um, and becomes more costly to make those decisions, people would be willing to pay more um, to to get good information and make good decisions uh, with their Bitcoin. So, with that, when the decisions become costly, uh, then you have you have a business that, um, or you have a, an industry that can support a data analytics industry, which is where I would put Amboss space. That makes sense. Now I want to, I want to talk about this, uh, in the context of lightning because data analytics, we've seen, we've seen a number of explorers that have a lot of success on chain. There's, there's a ton of them. There's coin metrics, there's glass node, there's probably half a dozen or more. Um, on Lightning, everything's kind of private by design, or it's less. There, there's less information to share. Um, why did you then? 
how, how do you think about like building that same data analytics business in a space that naturally just doesn't have as much available information? I think it's going to be, it's like the most interesting problem for us because uh, here we have this technology that is private by design. This is what everybody loves about it. Um, however, private uh, doesn't necessarily mean uncoordinated. Um, and so when, when we're thinking about which tools to build, uh, we want to provide tools that aid in uh, people coordinating their their activities um, and having a clear idea of what the market is. So, so the Lightning Network operates on gossip. Each node is sharing information about other nodes, and that that information propagates throughout the network. Um, all, all of the nodes actually have their own idea of what the of what the network looks like, um, and Ambos Space is one version of that. Uh, of course, we have a couple of nodes feeding into the the database that you're able to search through um, on on the website today. Um, but uh, overall, our our view of the network is slightly different than than others' view. Um, but we just package it up nicely so so you can be able to interpret that information. Right. Okay. So now, if I'm if I am someone who wants to allocate resources on the Lightning Network, if I want to run a business as a routing node, let's say, um, what are some of the keys or like some of the pieces of information that I'm looking for today? Like, what are some of the successful routing nodes looking out for? Um, because I, I, I tried kind of like as a hobbyist, I have a little umbral. Um, I, I've routed a bit of payments, never got to the point where it was something that I viewed as, uh, you know, something I wanted to dedicate my time to. And it, to me, it, it was really confusing, to be honest, of like, I don't know where the payments are coming from. I don't know where they're going to. I, it's so hard for me to predict where I should be putting capital, how much I should be putting. So there was a lot of questions for me. And I, but I'm curious to know, like, what some of the good node operators, what are they doing and how are they making those decisions of where to move their money? Yeah. Um... A lot of this comes down to like getting to know the network. Um, when you're making decisions about uh, how to allocate capital, you have to have an idea of what does the lightning economy actually look like right now? Uh, there's a couple of uh, merchants that are selling goods um, or services over lightning uh, and, and they have a need for inbound capacity. So, so that means that the network anywhere on the network would be able to pay to them. And so your job as a router would be able to uh, connect the network to them uh, and be that intermediate hop. So because SATs are, are scarce, uh, you're going to need to determine, okay, how large of a channel am I going to open? What type of payments are, is this company going to receive? Um, will they, are they selling cars? Do I need to open up a, a massive Wumbo channel? Um, or are they, uh, selling, uh, like pins or, uh, or, um, stickers? Uh, and so maybe a smaller channel might be appropriate. Uh, so, hmm. so just kind of in theory, uh, what is, uh, what do I think the, the economy looks like? And then once you've allocated and open channels, you'll start to get data about where the payments are flowing, where are they coming from and where they're going to. So if you get a lot of payments coming from a node, you can understand that they are well connected. Um, and, and they, they have a lot of connections on the network, or at least that's where the customers are. And then if you have a popular destination, you can see that, okay, a lot of, a lot of people are, are paying towards this destination and maybe I should allocate more capital, uh, to, to them. Uh, whereas when you're searching mm. for sources, it's going to be kind of random. I just need different spots on the network and hopefully those payments come towards me. Uh, so a lot of this comes right. from kind of guesswork, but then you are able to confirm that with data. Uh, and one of the pieces that comes out with data is you see a ton of payments going towards swap services uh, where they would pay lightning and receive on chain. So the, the two major ones that I see are 
uh, Lightning Loop node and and Bitfinex's node, where you're able to deposit Sats and withdraw mm. on chain. So um, understanding that right. and uh, w once you have that information, then you start setting fees um, and trying to establish what is the cost of liquidity on on the Lightning Network, which is like. Oh, this is once you're, once you're familiar, this is beyond the pleb stage. Okay. Now I'm trying to make money doing this. Um, and, and how I'm going mm -hmm. to allocate efficiently. And do you think that, well, actually today, I, I think there are a few people that are making good money. I've seen some of the tweets from guys like Alex Bosworth and he's, I think he's doing a few thousands of dollars a month routing payments. Do you think this becomes a more common theme over time that people make full incomes from just being a router or does that centralize over time? What does that look like from a, from a business standpoint? If someone's trying to run a node, is that something you foresee as like a viable career in the future? Um, for people that are uh, using their own savings, their own Bitcoin savings, uh, and trying to allocate that, I don't see that as being a very common, common role for people. Um, right now it's really exciting. Um, and there's a, there's a large motivator for like altruism on the, on the lightning network. Um, there's, there's a big desire just to make the lightning network successful. Um, and a lot of uh, people have the idea that I can do that cheaply. Um, and just, just by being re a really cheap network, uh, this will solve the, the issue and make Lightning Network successful. Um, let's see. So, so there, there are a couple of people doing, doing altruism, but uh, more generally, I think uh, what is going to sustain the network in creating this sustainable payment network that is high performance, um, I imagine those people will be economically motivated and they'll be looking for looking for fees and we'll have, um, smart people that have, uh, have an understanding of the lightning network from, from first principles that will be, uh, helping others to allocate their capital and make good decisions with their liquidity. Right. Okay. Um, that's really interesting. So I've seen a couple of people on Twitter, specifically there's one guy named zero fee routing or zero fee router or something like that. And that account is, is doing a ton of routing, earning nothing for it. Um, so you don't think that that over time becomes a, is a common thing. You think that basically over time, there's going to be all the, the dominant nodes are going to be ones that are earning, um, significant money or, you know, yeah. Uh, zero fee routing is, is a, a fascinating case. Um, so, so this, uh, this is like the, I guess the poster child for, um, for altruism, uh, on, on the lightning network and they're, you know, allocating tons of Bitcoin to all of these destinations. Um, and what, what we can tell from the lightning network right now is the fees that you charge, um, establish a trade-off between the, the economic gains that you make and the information that you receive. So if, if your fees are zero, you will get the most information about where payments are going. Now that's, this is very useful information. Um, of course, you know, there's, there's also the question of, well, is this person selling this information, uh, to, to others? Does this hop, does one hop in the lightning network become less private because of that? Uh, so there's, right. there's a privacy question about it. But then uh, also another thing that zero fee routing did quite recently was actually sell channels. So you pay a certain amount of sats and uh, kind of like uh, what Ellen Big does um, where, okay, yeah. so they're, they're selling channels. Oh, I'll open a channel to you. And so, so then you can, you can generate income that way. Um, but that, that income doesn't happen on the lightning network itself. Um, so you can still be a profitable node by selling channels while still charging nothing for the actual activity of routing. Mm, so it may just be that there's like alternate revenue streams and node operators could, could earn from that. 
or I guess, could it be almost like, could node operators use zero fees at an initial standpoint to be like a loss leader, understand where payments are flowing and then put on fees and all of a sudden they're in business. Exactly. Yeah. You can, you could ratchet good? it up from there. Uh, so you might start with altruism, but, uh, I, I wouldn't be so attached to that idea that, you know, you need to maintain zero fees because eventually you will need to rebalance, uh, your channels. Um, and if, if people are getting a lot of payment failures going through your node, because you have liquidity misallocated, then, uh, they're going to lose out. Oh, the lightning network will not be a high performance network. Um, and we'll have really low rely reliability payments. Um, when I went to El Salvador mm -hmm. for, uh, the adopt new Bitcoin conference, um, you know, a lot of us were trying to use our own, uh, node equipment in order to pay to these destinations in El Salvador, uh, because it, we could buy, uh, goods, uh, in person, uh, with the lightning network, which is a very exciting thing, but a lot of us were having failures. Uh, I think maybe like a rosy estimate might be 60% of lightning networks are going to succeed on the first try. Um, whereas mm. composed like, as opposed to visa or mastercard or American express where, you know, they've got 99.99, you know, percent reliability that this payment will go through. Like, yes, it will take two weeks or uh, 30 days to settle finally. Um, but that's, that's eventually who we will be competing against with the lightning network. Right now, the Lightning Network is cheaper, it's faster, um, and but our payments aren't very reliable. So while they're while all these big payment processors are battling over the last nine in terms of reliability, uh, the trade-off is is privacy um, and information maybe maybe leaking, uh, for example, and or like uh, the Target leak uh, where everyone's payment information got got leaked to. Uh, the, the internet, uh, the lightning network isn't structured like that. Um, so, so I think we'll be in a good position compared to these payment processors. If we can get that payment reliability higher. Right. I've noticed myself, like when I first got on board with lightning network, almost, almost a year ago, I guess, um, it was very hard to, to get a payment through. I've noticed like in the progression of the last six or eight months that that's really improved for me, but you're right. Like it's, it's definitely not 99%. Um, so I got a question then about reliability and the trade-offs between security and, and fees over time, as we ramp up from whatever we say today is, if we're at 60% of payments go through, let's just use that as a round number up to that 99.99. Um, is there, do you think that fees will remain at the level they are? Will professional routers come in, command a higher fee rate? Will that kind of change what the average user pays? And then from a security perspective, do you think that the network remains in this like decentralized state or relatively decentralized state, or does it centralize over time if some of these professional routers come in and, and maybe, maybe is there a trade-off there in terms of like privacy? Curious to hear your thoughts on that. It's a, it's a big one. Um, so the, <laughs> I guess that second part on, uh, centralization, um, it's, it's not quite clear right now. Um, r right now we, we do have high performance nodes. Um, I mean, when zero fee routing says that, uh, you know, how many payments they're routing, um, a lot of the movement seems to be, oh, well, they're routing a ton of payments. Maybe I should connect to them. Um, and like, but, but maybe that, that makes it easier to go through this one node. So it's sort of a positive feedback loop. Whereas, uh, if you do want to actually earn more, uh, you might try and, uh, undercut, um, and say, I want to provide fewer hops, uh, to, to the destinations that are getting paid to. If I open a channel to zero fee routing, I'll see payments go to, go, go to them. And, but I don't know what the actual destination is. Well, where are people trying to pay to if they're going through that node? Mm -hmm. Um, and so you won't get that information. 
And so this is where you need to try new channels and decentralize the network um, so that so you can get better information and allocate your own capital more efficiently. Um, as turn on the on the front of fees, um, right right now what we're seeing um, like lightning uh, routing nodes uh, they use arbitrage. Essentially, that's that's what that is. Can I can I buy inbound liquidity cheaper than I can sell it? Um, and but uh, these buys and sells are a little bit weird because it's like, uh, yeah, you get inbound liquidity by other people uh, opening channels to you, and you sell it by routing a payment to them. Uh, so, uh, but overall, it's an arbitrage starting with the on-chain fees. So, uh, in order to establish channels, I have to pay a mining fee uh, in order to create a channel, and then at the end of its life. I will have to close that channel. So uh, you are making a trade on uh, kind of the future mempool condition. Uh, and and you're comparing that to whatever fee rate you're charging by running payments. Right. And so do you think that if, if the mempool gets super congested and fees really dramatically rise on chain, that's gonna bleed over into Lightning? Uh, yeah, I mean, half of, uh, for lightning, half of your costs are already in the past. Um, so if you establish your channel at, uh, one sat per byte mempool condition, basically an empty mempool, um, in the future, mm -hmm. when it ramps up, like you're only going to have to pay one on chain fee to really recover that. Um, so you can, you could ratchet up your, uh, your channel fees, um, and, and be able to kind of enjoy that arbitrage, say, say that the mempool is con congested and I can't get a Bitcoin payment through. I'm going to have to pay $50 or whatever uh, to make a transaction. Um, and like, mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. Um, I'd much rather use the Lightning Network and get that uh, get that instant feedback. Um, and merchants may, may demand it because they get the final settlement right away. Um, and it's a much nicer... Um, customer experience. Right. Now, do you think, do you think fees from a user perspective, from someone who's not, maybe not running a node, but is like engaging with different lightning apps, do you think they're going to see meaningful like fee increases over time or because a lot of the big applications would have connected to a lot of the big wallets, right? And some of those payments that are happening between wallets and applications might not need a hop at all could just be like a direct transfer. Um, yeah. That, what do you think about that? Um, I think a lot of it relies on uh, how expensive is it to run a node? Um, and what we're, mm. what I'm watching right now is uh, some of these like very inexpensive nodes, um, which is, uh, I think the, the name of it is the Nautil Light or the Nautilito. Uh, which is a very small uh, device, um, and it's like uh, it's under the two hundred dollar price point, and you can have a functioning node. Um, and if you're able to to run a node uh, like that, then we won't be using these uh, custodial services so much um, because we are making trade offs with them in terms of in terms of trust or uh, potentially in terms of uh, reliability or just the functionality that you can add on. I mean, look at Umbral, where you can stack on all these apps um, where you can be running a, a pie hole and saving yourself from ads at the same time as a video server and a photo server. Um, it's like a home enhancement. This is kind of what it turns into. Um, so, yeah. so when I'm looking at this, I'm looking at, okay, is the price point of running a node going down? And the answer to me is yes. Um, so we will get more people running this in a decentralized fashion uh, because those those principles of sovereignty and privacy are important. Mm -hmm. And now, do you see any interesting use cases bleeding over into Amboss then? Like once there's people running, run, more people running nodes, do you think then there starts to be new things you could do on Amboss with that? Like you do have, you have the communities already 
you have the verified nodes, you can send messages and stuff. What are some of those other things that you've been, is there anything you've been thinking about that like, oh, we could do this if we have a critical mass of people with a node? Um, right now we're in a phase of rapid experimentation. Um, we're trying things all of the time. Uh, I don't know if you looked at Amboss space six months ago, I don't know that you would really recognize it. Um, because like. A lot of these things are user driven. We'll see a little bit of traction on a few ideas. People are going to try things uh, on on Twitter, um, and we're just kind of watching this social network. And like, uh, we're we're trying to keep up with with features. Uh, for example, we added the the communities. Um, this was, I think, this was back in October, September, maybe, um, and. When, as soon as we added these communities, uh, we added an approval feature and we've watched these, these communities where, uh, individual members are approving other people to join their community. And we see lots of, uh, geographical based, uh, communities pop up, which has been stunning to me. Mm. And, you know, I've had to like learn more of, uh, take a look at an Atlas and <laughs> where, where are these countries? Um, let's see, but, uh. But yeah, there's some staggering growth, um, in communities, uh, there's, yeah, uh, let's see United States, of course is big, but, uh, Germany, Netherlands, uh, Japan has really wowed me. Um, and, uh, there's, I think there's several communities for Tonga now. Um, so, so this, the lightning network is, is a social network at the end of the day. Um, and we'll be doing our, our best to, to keep up and to identify these use, use cases as we're iterating really quickly. Is there anything that surprised you about the growth of the Lightning Network, maybe over the last 12 months, um, since we saw El Salvador announce, make an announcement in, I guess, May? Uh, the, I think some people might call it the, the umbral effect, um, but, uh, but really this, uh, the network itself has, has an incredible uh, effect. Um, if let's see Plebnet, for example, uh, just starting to, to run nodes and figuring things out, writing things down, making it easier for the next person, sort of like pay it forward behavior has, uh, has really created some staggering growth for the, for the lightning network. Um, now for those who don't know what is. Can you explain what Plebnet is for those who aren't? Clear? Sure. Uh, Plebnet is a community of node operators, um, and they're generally using uh, hobbyist hardware. Um, and uh, it's a community on, on Telegram, which you can access uh, from kycjelly.com. Uh, lots, uh, lots of sexy puns there, uh, but... Uh, but uh, yeah, generally they've, they've created a, a community that's, that's fun, engaging, and they've got a, uh, a wiki to support. Um, so that can show you how to do some of those things like, uh, run your first, uh, commands on, on commands line on your node and, uh, physically operate with this, with this computer that you have that is, uh, now doing decentralized finance for you. Okay. So I want to hear a prediction on how many nodes there will be on the Lightning Network in 2025? I've asked this question a few times to different guests, but I'd love to hear your take. 2025. Um, I think we're, I, I'd be comfortable saying there's uh, maybe around 60,000 nodes uh, that are operating on the Lightning Network. Okay. So that would be about Interesting. tripling in size uh, in four years. I'm, you know, I'm waiting with, with bated breath, uh, Amboss, uh, our business model relies heavily on, on user growth and node growth on the lightning network. So, uh, yeah, we're very much looking forward to that and we're incentivized to make it easy to run a node <laughs> because, uh, those are yeah. going to be our customers. For sure. Okay. So let's transition to the business and maybe specifically we can start with competition. Um, one of the first things that, that I think of is like, if, if the data that you're seeing 
on the network is publicly available, what is what is going to be Amboss's moat, right? And I guess this is an issue that on-chain explorers also face, where all the all the available data is just on the blockchain. Like, how do you think about crafting a moat and crafting like a an advantage over other explorers? That's a that's a great question and something that we really had to wrestle with, um, because like any as you said, anyone could could run uh, Amboss. Uh, you know, like with the, with the information that's available. Um, so our business relies heavily on one people come for the user experience. Uh, we've got a, what I think is a beautiful platform, um, that is, that is easy to navigate. Um, and then second, uh, we have to create, um, novel data sources. So, uh, you can't just rely on the public data. Uh, you will need to create your own type of data. And, and what we offer to, uh, subscribers or the, the members that, that, that pay us, um, we, uh, currently we're, we're offering like historical views. So we're indexing the lightning network. And so you'll be able to not only see the lightning network state as it is, but also the history, at, which, which feeds into, you know, what is a, what is a node's reputation? Uh, what have they done to to earn their status as uh, the the highest uh, Boz score or uh, or the the top of uh, Ellen Node Insight? Um, so mm. so you'll be able to see their their growth over time, and that's uh, that's just one of the novel uh, data pieces that we're planning on uh, uh, releasing for Amboss. But the historical view is is there today. Yeah. So so what would someone use? Like if I'm a, if I'm a node operator right now, would I just be looking at maybe popular nodes and seeing the popular nodes today? How did they grow and how did they get to that stage? Or is there any other reason I, I might want to access that historical data? Uh, yeah. I think right now it's it's just making. Uh, some difficult decisions about where to allocate your sats. Um, so if you, if you see a, a routing node and they have some interesting connections that, that maybe you don't have a lot of exposure to, uh, you'd be looking at their, their history and see, okay, how has this, how has this known gr node grown? Um, and, uh, yeah, how, how have they performed? Um, and, uh, one of the other things that, uh, we'll be working on is like, how do other nodes uh, feel about this node or uh, how does this node fit into the broader scheme of the lightning network? How, how do you measure that? I'm interested in that. Is, is this kind of the reputation idea that you mentioned a couple of times? Uh, yeah, certainly it's, uh, there's, uh, there, there will be a reputation score of, of sorts. Um, and like, there's a whole bunch of scores right now for, for the lightning network. Um, and, Right. It, it doesn't interest us so much to go for a, uh, a singular calculation that, okay, this node is, is this, this is at the top of the leaderboard because there's a lot of those, uh, you know, data points already, uh, which, which will gladly aggregate, um, and, and index those. So you, people can, you know, look at how this changes and be able to kind of compare uh, which which metric is important? Which what is a good metric um, that fits with my understanding of what a good node is? Mm, I see. And maybe it, could that be different for different nodes? For example, like if someone wants to see all the nodes that are the most connected, and someone wants to see the nodes that have the lowest fee rates, or or have different metrics that are interesting to either one. Absolutely. Yeah. Could that reputation like a a merchant that is selling different priced goods? I mean. Like if I'm selling expensive things, you know, I, I'm not interested in having a lot of channels. I'm having a few really big channels that is able to econom accommodate the goods that I have to sell. So, so there's tons of decisions uh, to make. Um, and like a big question for us as a business is just uh, how do we allocate our time resources to building this thing? Um, because we know these questions are going to come up. Um, and how is it best to display them and what's most important right now that will allow us to be a sustainable business as well as helping the network 
be a sustainable network. Right. Okay. So I, I know right now I see on your site, you guys have ads on the site. Um, you mentioned your subscription business. Do you foresee a lightning native business line where you're earning sats for some, some service or some like, I don't know if it's routing or if it's, if it's something unrelated, but do you think that, that Amboss takes on a, a lightning native stream of revenue? And, and do you think that becomes a meaningful source of income over time? Or do you think advertising subscription, some of the tried and true, um, you know, business models of the internet that we know today will be the primary, you know, income sources for the company over time. Uh, our bet will be the subscribers will, will dominate. Uh, currently it's, uh, it's advertising. Um, but I, I don't see that as a long-term form of revenue. Uh, some things like the key send billboard have, uh, been a kind of a surprise for us, uh, in terms of, in terms of revenue, because we're sorting, we're sorting messages that we receive, uh, in lightning network payments. Um, and we're displaying those on our, on our homepage. Um, and we're sorting that based on the, the, the amount that was paid. Uh, so we've, we've been somewhat surprised at how generous people have been. Uh, I think our customers right now recognize what we're doing and are willing to buy a subscription and just to support us, just keep building what you're building. Um, so right now we're relying heavily on the generosity of the lighting network, um, which, which has been, which has been good, uh, now, but like in terms of creating a sustainable business, uh, a lot of that will rely on us providing products that, that the lightning network needs to have, um, and kind of creating that defensibility moat, uh, when we're, when we're thinking about what other competitors are going to come in, cause I imagine it's going to be, uh, you know, visa or the large payment processors. They're going to want a piece of the action because, uh, the traditional model that Western union has been using, um, isn't going to, uh, it is it going to hold muster to, to what we have going on on the lighting network where it's cheap, fast and reliable. Yeah. Right. For, for some of your customers today, what are they, do you, do you get a sense that these customers are looking for certain features that aren't yet available? Or are there things that you wish you could provide them that, that, you know, would improve their experience? Like where does, where does this service business model go from here? How do you, how do you think about like adding new features to improve a node operator's success? Um, we love, uh, hanging out in the telegram group that we have, uh, for Amboss because, uh, people let us know right away if, uh, if one, if things aren't working right, um, or two, uh, whatever features they're, they're desiring, um, and so we see lots of demand for, uh, community features because like right mm -hmm. now, uh, to be quite honest, we're not offering a whole lot of features for the communities. However, people all over the world have assembled onto Amboss that has like a little tag on their node page that says, you know, I'm part of the Tonga liquidity group, or like I'm part of the diamond hands community. Um, the largest mm -hmm. node community in Japan, like. Uh, people go, go crazy for those things. Um, but, but really, uh, we're not providing very many services on there, but, uh, there's lots mm. of requests for, for more because, uh, like in this, in this social network is a lot of it is about association. Um, who are you connected to and who do you support? Uh, so like, while while the traditional, the payment processors are, are going to like de-platform uh, certain, certain people because of the payments that they, that they get, um, the lightning network might take the, the opposite tact and say, no, I, I want there to be, uh, like star backer where, you know, this is like, a, basically, an, a creator economy as, as they would call, but like only fans on the lightning network. Um, so basically just provide, provide this payment services for the people that aren't getting it. Um. And that, that just, uh, makes it a very anti-fragile network where 
we will see more people coming to the Lightning Network because it works. I mean, right now it's truckers in Canada. Um, so, yeah, like Hong Kong all the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, you've mentioned a couple of times the word social network when describing Lightning. Can you can you elaborate on exactly what that means? And because I think to a lot of people that is not going to come off as a, a very obvious kind of like comparison, right? We think we think money's moving through the light now, but this is like payments, this is Visa. It's not Facebook, it's not Twitter. Um, what exactly do you mean by social network? Um, let's see. So on Facebook, for example, you might add a friend. On Twitter, uh, you're going to be following someone. And so you're going to be getting bits of information uh, from these from these individuals. Um, when it comes to the Lightning Network, what we're dealing in is financial infrastructure. And every channel that you get is going to be competing with each other in order to provide you with payments. So it, like as you get more and more competitors, you know, the price uh, for you to get paid becomes lower and lower. And in a way, it means there's like a passive endorsement. Uh, like a moral endorsement of whatever you're doing. So uh, one one thing that we really liked to see was uh, Preston Pish. He shared his Amboss link uh, to to his node, which pulled some data like from his from his node, and it 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 showed that, and he had it as his pinned tweet for like a, a week. And just because of that, you know, he had a lot of eyes on his Twitter profile, um, and it caused him to be one of the fastest, or it was the fastest growing node on the Lightning Network uh, for that week. So um, this tells me that like people are wanting to connect uh, to others in a meaningful way um, using financial infrastructure. Now, you may not mm -hmm. be able to DM Preston, but you can damn well send him a key send message. Um, and that goes directly to his, his node. So yeah writing a message, putting it within a lightning payment to him, uh, kind of saying, Hey, press in, I love what you're doing. Uh, keep making great podcasts and talk more about the lightning network. Got it. Can you, can you break down key send itself for listeners? Um, I, I, I'm not super familiar on the technical details. I believe that's how I'm receiving messages from listeners right now, um, through uh, lightning podcasting apps, but I'd love for like a, a beginner friendly kind of explanation of exactly what key send is sure. and maybe some potential use cases that, that could develop for it over time. Yeah. Um, let's see, I'm not the most technical one, so I will give you a entry level understanding because that's what I have. Um, but, uh, it, in general, it is an, an, a payment that does not require an invoice. So. Uh, as an input to this, I'm going to pay uh, a node's public key. So normally when you do a, a Lightning Network payment, you have to contact the, the person that you're paying and say, hey, can you send me an invoice uh, for this amount so that I can pay you? Um, which is a really awkward thing to do um, like uh, for, for the internet. So what I would much rather do, especially in a tipping scenario, is just be able to spontaneously throw you a payment um, and not have to request an invoice. So say like, I wanna pay you $5, but like, can you send me an invoice so that I can gift you $5? It, like, it's awkward. Um, so so what KeySend enables, um, which is like a bit of a hacky way to do things, um, is it allows you to, to make, make a payment. However, one of the trade-offs is you won't get a receipt for the payment that you make. Um, so, so this will affect your record keeping as uh, we've witnessed for our Keysend billboard, um, where like the records for our like our payments in our node like might be kind of a mess just because we've enabled this Keysend billboard. Um, so one thing, yeah, that's that's just a thing to keep in mind. It won't be as as tidy. Um, because you won't have an invoice to match up with a payment. However, you can embed text in your in your payment. 
and you can format that in a couple of different ways. Um, so a lot of the questions that we receive is, uh, how do I, how do I format this, this text in this key send message to go onto the billboard? Um, and so consequently we do see lots of test messages on the, on the billboard, but generally they're paying one sat and they'll get, uh, washed out by other higher fee paying messages. Right now, do you see any interesting applications for sending specifically like text messages back and forth? Cause like it's definitely happening on lightning podcasting mm. today. Um, I believe, I believe Sphinx is using key send as well, right? Is that for, for their chat app? Um, I could be wrong on that. Yeah. One, but yeah, they, they are. Do you, um, they're, okay. uh, do you see any other use cases for that? Absolutely. Like, do you, do you see any other businesses that are like waiting to be built around messaging over lightning? I think the, uh, sort of a quick shout out to Alex Bosworth. Cause he's been, uh, along with, uh, Nitesh, he's been, uh, they, they've been building all sorts of different like trades that you can do over key send. Um, so, uh, one of the things is open a balanced channel and you can do that in a like mostly trustless fashion using, um, a series of exchange key send messages that is automated with that boz, uh, the balance of Satoshi script. And it mm. makes it a pretty slick experience, but this, this is all happening in command line. Um, and there hasn't been, uh, like a nice graphical user interface, uh, to interact with. So it's going to be mostly for the, for the hackers at this point, but there's, yeah, you can, uh, form whatever type of contract you might want to do over key send, uh, just kind of sending those, those parameters. Um, so yes, you will have to deal with some of the trade-offs of not having an, an invoice. Um, but, uh, overall, like it's, it's just kind of cool. Um, it's a, it's a, like a nerdy tech, but, um, overall, like, I'm not sure that it's going to dominate messaging because what, I think we have all become accustomed to paying zero for, for our messages that we, we send to each other. Um, but, but key send messages are, are encrypted. They're, you know, uh, routed through like several nodes, um, and sort of like onion routing. Um, it, so it's, a, it's a very private way to communicate, but overall expensive compared to other options. And they all, they all come with stats, right? Any, any payment over ETHN? Yeah. You have to send Must a payment. Um, and so there's also restrictions on the lightning network where you might have, uh, you can only have like 483, um, in-flight payments, uh, in a given channel at once. So yeah, there, there are some real constraints on the lightning network, uh, that would prevent wide like global scale communication from happening on the lightning network itself. Right. Do you think we ever face an issue where the lightning network itself starts to get congested? Like we've seen this now happen on multiple different blockchains over the last five or so years in different periods. And sometimes people have kind of gone through blockchain explorers and found, oh, you know, so-and-so is using this percentage of all transactions, uh, their spam, why are they even on here? Like why we don't want them. And Someone else comes back and says, well, they're paying a fee. They're, they're going by the rules of the network. Um, I've seen some like pretty vigorous back and forth debate on like what, what should exist on as a transaction on a lot of these different networks. Um, do you think that there's, there's an issue with that on lightning brewing? Like, is that something that over time, just, we just get congestion on lightning. Um, I'm so glad you brought this up because it's, it feels like a conversation that just is not happening. Um, because like for Bitcoin, like we had the block size debate, um, and that had to do really with, with how the, the Bitcoin network is going to scale. But the same thing is happening on the lightning network gossip layer. Uh, there's going to be people using the lightning network for all sorts of weird applications, whether it's whether it's messaging, whether it's, um, like another, uh, social network or, uh, whatever, like other use cases are going to emerge. Um, and the, the Bitcoin community, the lightning network community is 
going to have to have a debate at the protocol level about what types of activities should happen on this payment network. Um, is it going to be a payment network first or uh, is it going to be a, an application layer where we're going to be doing all sorts of things on there? Um, and it's it's impacting our operations because when when someone you know modifies uh, their fee rate on on their channels, they expect to see that information on our Lightning Network Explorer um, almost immediately. But the reality is, like that information is getting propagated through nineteen thousand nodes on the network, um, and we hope to be one of the first ones to receive that message and update our database. Uh, but the reality is that message may get drowned out by all sorts of other activities that might be happening. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, we're going to need to make real decisions on, uh, yeah. How do we, how do we want to scale the lightning network? Uh, this isn't so much of a problem right now, but like it's the lightning network is growing exponentially. So we're going to have to quickly yeah. deal with this. And you're right there. This is something that. I, I haven't heard much discussion about on Twitter. I wasn't even sure if it was a problem. So I'm glad this is this is something that is on your radar and, and this is something that seems to be an issue right now. Uh, or, or not right now, but over time. Um, now, it, we've talked about messaging, we've talked about payments. Are there any other applications that could generate congestion on the network? And as a follow-up there, what are some of the ways you might think about or other people might think about uh, deciding what is a acceptable use of the light network and what is not? Um, the first part is asking me to predict all of the things that uh, people will build on the lightning network. And frankly, I just have no idea. I'm really bullish on the creativity <laughs> um, because this, uh, the lightning network is is a field that is open for innovation. So whatever you want to build, uh, you're probably going to want to build that on the Lightning Network um, because because of all of its features already and the network effect it has. Um, what people might want to consider is uh, if if you're running a node and you want to be able to pay anywhere in the world, you're going to have to download. Uh, essentially you have to have like a map of the lightning network and and that may mean that uh you're going to be downloading a lot of information just to find out about all the destinations that you can pay to and how long is that going to take um for you to get all synced up uh mm. and it it may eventually impact uh, the size of the or the cost of running a node uh, doing the the decentralized thing. Now, like, of course, there's another feedback loop happening there because if if it's cheaper to run a node, then you're going to have more nodes on the network, and then there will be an even bigger graph uh, to download. Um, so I, I'm not totally sure about all the all all the trade offs, um, but it's a there's there's a debate to be had there. Um, on, on what to build. I, I don't have a, the right. Right answer right now. Fair enough. Um, okay. So now uh, a couple more predictions. I, I want to hear your thoughts on. Um, so we already discussed the node growth prediction, but which grows faster, capacity or nodes or channels on a percentage basis over, let's say, I don't know, we we'll say over 2025 as well, the next three years. Among those three metrics, which is going to be the fastest growing? Uh, from the application developers, I'm. I think I'm going to see a lot more channels out of them. Uh, so if we go more application focused, definitely channels. Um, for capacity, uh, I think a lot of that relies on uh, the mempool um, and the fee rates and and also the cost to run a node. Um, so people have Bitcoin. It's in cold storage right now. I saw Michael Saylor tweet. Uh, yeah, looking for ways to earn yield on my Bitcoin um, or something along those lines. And so that got me excited because right now, yeah, you can earn non-custodial yield on the Lightning Network. Uh, so <laughs> join up. <laughs> uh, so that would yeah. be huge for capacity growth. And 
So yeah, there's nothing stopping whales from from joining right now. Um, do you think that's something that MicroStrategy does? Do you think that they step in and become like a lightning service provider or some build some like software business around that? Because they have the software expertise. They've been doing that for 25 years, whatever, 30 years, I don't know. And they have a ton of Bitcoin. And he's been clear in the past that he said he's, he's on, on past calls, he's been, said he's been looking at potentially doing something, never confirmed anything. But like, does that seem like it's a reasonable path forward if you have a lot of Bitcoin, you're watching the network grow, and you, you have a software background? I can't wait to see it. Uh, if, if, when, if it what happens. Would you do if, you were, <laughs> if you were Michael Saylor, what would you do? Um, yeah, I think I might want to go the LSP route, um, become a lightning service provider and start opening channels to people that, that want it. Um, but I think a lot of things need to happen because he's, uh, well, he's super bullish on Bitcoin. I think overall, you know, he's a very conservative, uh, person when it comes to money matters. Um, he's making huge bets. Uh, he's taking on debt for like the first time, which is like, <laughs> it seems kind of scary for the, the company, uh, seems absolutely nuts, com uh, compared to like traditional finance stuff. But, but yeah, he's, I think he might be slower to, to get this, get a board on involved, um, and make sure that this is the right path for a company. But overall, um, the, the Lightning Network is, is open, um, and it's providing some amount of yield, very low, but, uh, but yeah, there it's an, it's an option. So you can have the upside of Bitcoin, uh, plus, uh, provide a meaningful service, uh, to the operators. And you could also earn yield. So you can earn yield through routing, right. And you can also earn yield through opening channels, right. For a fee. Um, using like a, like a pool, like service, right. Mm -hmm. Um, which do you think over time, do you think, do you think those, uh, fee rates kind of converge, like the yield you could earn as a router and as a channel opener, I guess would kind of like converge over time. Um, maybe, uh, we'll, we'll have to see. I mean, I'll, I'll be, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm interested in like getting those things going because then we'll start getting information on, on where the demand is. Um, and overall it will be mm -hmm. a market, uh, whether you want a channel right now that is cheap, you know, you might, you might choose to just buy a channel from someone versus, uh, if you want to make an agreement for the, for the long term, you might actually start a social relationship with this person. And then, uh, you can negotiate fee rates, um, all, all sorts of things. Um, and it's, it's going to be based on need. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a poor predictor of markets. I cannot trade to save my life or predict where the price is going. But, uh, but for the most part, um, people will try things out. Uh, this yeah. like plebnetic, um, has been a massive a experiment, um, where you can have complete novices, uh, join the lightning network and figure it out. Uh, get comfortable, get uncomfortable, what, what have you. Um, and, uh, yeah, we've been trying all sorts of things. What do you think the total addressable market is for lightning? Like if we, in terms of Bitcoin, right, there's 21 million Bitcoin. Um, the way I think about it in my head is that this is that there's in a mature state, it's in my, my opinion, at least I, I kind of think of it as like, there's going to be a chunk, a small chunk probably of total Bitcoin that is on lightning and that, you know, people can use for applications or it can kind of like act as a, as a cash where you, you know, 20 years ago, I guess no one really carries bills around anymore, but like 20 years ago, you would have carried a small portion of your net worth in your wallet at all times. It's there, it's ready, it's free to transact. Um, I kind of think that might be that that's at least how I'm thinking about, um, the lightning networks addressable market and like how big it becomes as a percentage of Bitcoin. But I'd love to hear how you approach that question. Uh, right now, I think the features of lightning, uh, make it really uh, appealing for certain use cases. Uh, the, the first I would look at is remittances. 
uh, just Western Union in a given year, it's going to do $70 billion worth of cross-border payments. Um, that is a massive increase for the Lightning Network if it were to disrupt just Western Union. If you look at remittances mm -hmm. as a whole, globally, in a given year, $589 billion. So that is, uh, that is over a 500-fold increase uh, for, for the Lightning Network. Um, if you think it's going to disrupt uh, credit cards, uh, American Express, um, it's a lot bigger number. I don't have that number memorized, but it is well, <laughs> well into the trillions. Um, yeah, this is uh, this is a huge market, um, and it will need a data analytics company to support that level of decision making that's happening on a global scale. Um, and that's where I hope Ambos to be. Very cool. Okay, um, one final question: What is the most exciting? Lightning application today to you? To me, um, let's see. I, I think uh, I'll, I'll just I'll just throw it out there. But um, uh, I'll be right now. Um, just being able to improve the experience of running around the internet and being able to um, make payments, send tips, get past paywalls. Um, like yeah. what a, an enormous pain point to get good writing out there um, and reward content creators. Um, like su super bullish on just being able to authenticate and have uh, in a way a digital identity based on hardware um, it, it, and be able to like immediately participate in commerce with a little browser plugin. Like right. that's cool. 100% agree. I think that's very cool. And so, so there's Albi doing that uh, within a browser. And then there's also Impervious that is going to be releasing their lightning first browser, right? That's coming, I think in April, but awesome. um, yeah, very excited about both those as well. Um, okay. It was great to spend some time and chat more about lightning. Tell listeners where they can, where they can go to learn more about you and about Amboss. Sure. Um, you can follow Amboss at Amboss Tech uh, on Twitter. Uh, our explorer is amboss.space, A-M-B-O-S-S -S dot space. Um, and then you can follow me at Justifer underscore BTC. Awesome. Thanks for taking the time and uh, all the best with Amboss. Thanks so much. Welcome to the lightning round presented by Voltage. Voltage is the premier provider of Bitcoin and Lightning Node infrastructure. Many of the apps and services you already use in the Bitcoin and Lightning ecosystem already use Voltage um, to scale their business quickly and easily without any maintenance. Um, Voltage also offers an inbound liquidity product called Flow that helps you as a node operator get inbound liquidity quickly and easily. Um, overall, Voltage is creating the industry standard of non-custodial products helping brands and startups and entrepreneurs scale. To learn more about Voltage, visit voltage.cloud. All right, let's get into it now. We had 12 different supporters this week send in sats. That's gotta be a record high in the last seven days. Uh, so thank you for everyone who sent in sats. Real quick, I'll run through the top five. Mary Oscar sent in 7722 sats. Raj Hoddle sent in 1489. Uh, an anonymous user sent in 990. Bitspooky sent in 990. Thrillrex sent in 495. That's what it takes to make the top five these days, 495 sats. Um, there were also three messages that came in in the last couple of days. First one from Bitspooky he says, brilliant episode, excellent, in response to episode 19 with Andre Neves of Zebedee. That one is quickly becoming one of my most popular episodes. Definitely check it out if you have not seen it already. Um, at Y sends in a message as well. It says amazing episode in response to the same one. Um, he says this episode and the key and Kusha episode stacker news, uh, opened my eyes to the hive of activity, bringing Bitcoin to life. Now, why is also asking how to set up a lightning address or, or where to find a lightning address? Because, uh, some of the wallets that Y is using does not support lightning addresses yet. If anyone wants to get a lightning address and does not have one, 
you can use, you can go to lightningaddress.com and you can see a list of services of apps and wallets that provide lightning addresses. Um, LN Markets, I know, I know has them off the top of my head. Zebedee, of course. Uh, I know Stacker News has them. If you have a Stacker News account, your username on Stacker News is the beginning of your lightning address. It's username at stacker.news. Uh, so it should be pretty easy to get a lightning address. Um, it's going to be easier over time. More companies are adopting them. Um, but a bit of a growing pain right now because today I cannot currently send SATs to a user on Phantom, so I need a lightning address. And in this episode, Raven once again was the only one to send in a lightning address with a comment. And Raven says, are you following the SpaceX Starship development? Um, I'm not following it super closely, Raven. Uh, I've been a fan of Tesla for a while, uh, have a Tesla, um, have not given SpaceX the time it deserves to really study exactly what they're building. Um, but uh, I appreciate you sending in the, the question and the sats and your lightning address. So you are the winner of 1900 sats. Now we're on episode number 20. Uh, instead of giving away 2000 sats, that would be cool if I gave away a free month of uh, voltage hosted node. So anyone who sends in a comment uh, this week, send in your Twitter handle, actually, not your, not your lightning address or a telegram handle or something. Um, I will send you a code for a free month of a voltage node. So you can test out the lightning network as a node operator. If you've been meaning to give the lightning network a shot, can't wait to see all your comments and questions. See you in a few days.